Mike Grimm with Optic Cyber Solutions. Today I'm going to provide a brief overview of the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, or FISMA, um, some of its key components, some of the drivers for the, uh, the act, and how it's helped shape a lot of the security compliance um, and regulation for the federal government. FISMA was originally released as the uh, Federal Information Security Management Act, and then later updated to the Modernization Act in 2014. But as part of the initial releases uh, for 20, uh, 2002, as part of the E-Government Act, I did have a few key areas for, um, you know, the instantiation of the law. Um, they did have a strong protection mandate, essentially to ensure that government systems um, were protected, the data and systems, both government-owned and government-managed, uh, which is really a key um, component. Um, obviously, the U.S. government, systems that they own and operate would have to um, fall under the uh, FISMA mandate, but also any uh, uh, contractors that managed or um, operated uh, systems on behalf of the government also scoped in as part of this part of this law. Um, it's also in response to a digital uh, mandate. At the time in 2002, the government was still, you know, uh, heavily um, paper focused. But as they moved more into modernization with new IT systems, it was a recognition that you did you needed to have uh, strong security protections um, and controls as you had for physical protection for you know locked locked uh, file cabinets and things uh, of that nature to also be moved more into the, the technical arena with IT systems. Uh, there was also a strong economic and national security focus as well. Um, obviously, the government runs on, you know, supports uh, critical missions um, across the U.S. government, and then those systems obviously um, are, are part of that, that mission. And there was a strong security or uh, cybersecurity focus as well, um, essentially focusing on the protection of confidentiality, integrity, availability for uh, the systems and data uh, that the U.S. The US um, government systems process across the different systems um, and branches and departments for the U.S. government. So there were a few key uh, drivers of FISMA as released in 2002, primarily focused around uh, information security, the need for it, um, and the systems that processed that information. Um, to include, you know, sensitive data for the government, also any uh, U.S. data um, of its citizens, so things like uh, social security numbers. Um, there was also increasing dependence on information technology, um, you know, new need or needs for additional storage, um, new uh, models, paradigms as you move from mainframes into uh, client-server technologies, um, increasing rise of cybersecurity threats um, as well to include, you know, hacking and things like that. Um, the need for standardized security practices um, at the time in 2002, really uh, different agencies or um, different parts of the government, even within the same um, organization, may have implemented security practices, security controls in different manners. It really was inconsistent. Um, so it was really a need for that standardization. Um, and also uh, the last one here is compliance and accountability. Um, at the time, it really it depended on the organization as far as um, compliance checks, auditing, and things like that, um, and accountability, of, um, ultimately, where that really laid or lied within the organization, and so uh, FISMA sought to address these items. Some of the key expectations for FISMA include uh, risk management. Essentially, um, agencies are required to conduct regular risk assessments um, of the organizations to essentially determine the level of security needed uh, to protect their, their relevant uh, systems within the organization. Um, and then next, to, uh, to select security controls <clears throat> as defined in FIPS 200. So essentially, the, uh, the required controls for the type of uh, information that the system processes, low, moderate, or high, as an example. And then from there, actually operationalized via the uh, risk management framework, which is really the, the framework that has uh, seven steps where the organization would go through, categorize systems, understand um, the types of systems they have, uh, low, moderate, high, and then implement those security controls as defined in the um, controls catalog in NIST 853. And then finally, compliance and reporting, where here they would do the um, annual assessments, audits, and then actually um, ultimately report those findings to Congress to ensure that the organization has maintained a, a baseline level of security um, over time. In 2014, the Management Act was updated with the Modernization Act, um, and all the items listed here are all additive to the uh, 2002 Act, but uh, 2014 really focused on the refinement of reporting requirements and an uh, enhanced, enhanced focus on cyber breach notification. Um, there was also a defined role or leadership role for the Department of Homeland Security um, around you know, pushing out uh, information security best practices for federal uh, federal systems, federal government organizations. And we see that today with uh, CISA pushing out the um, as part of that component of DHS, some of these cybersecurity forward um, guidance and things like that. Zero Trust is a, is a big one currently. And then also development of the binding operational directives, uh, which are typically um, items that will uh, require 
systems to be patched, if there are critical vulnerabilities that are seen across the government um, as a whole, um, that's really typically when the binding operation directives will come into play. Um, there's also uh, reporting requirements that uh, shift um, in focus to more around threats, security incidents, and then compliance with security requirements. And then, as I mentioned, the cyber breach notification, uh, which required the um, uh, executive branch civilian agencies to notify and consult with U.S. CERT uh, regarding security incidents. And overall, I think the, the overall focus is for uh, more visibility for the government, uh, kind of see where um, security posture is across agencies, and then obviously to be able to use that, that information to ingest and and show there's an uplift or at least notification if there's a critical threats or things like that across the, organ across the, the government as a whole um, to show that it's a holistic approach on cybersecurity um, from a government perspective. In closing, I'd like to leave you with a, a few resources. Um, at Optic Cyber Solutions, we have uh, various resources. Uh, one most pertinent, pertinent to this conversation is a risk management framework overview that we've done, uh, which kind of walks through the, the seven steps of the, um, the RMF. Um, also have a listing here of the uh, PDF version of RMF uh, uh, NIST 837, as well as the, the Security Controls Catalog 853, and then the, uh, the RMF Overview website that NIST has as well. Um, so again, I'm Mike Green with Optic Cyber Solutions. Thank you for watching. Optic Cyber Solutions strives to help organizations identify and address their blind spots through our assessment, implementation, and advising services. For more information about Optic Cyber Solutions or how we can help you gain confidence in your cybersecurity, reach out at info at optic.com or check out our website at opticcyber.com.